Each week, Richard and Father Mark present a rigorous discussion of the Bible in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. Over 24,000 episodes are downloaded each month at no charge. Please consider marking your level of support with a one-time donation or by pledging a small amount per episode. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's P-A-C-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. How can a teacher reach someone who is set in their ways or engulfed by ideology? What if the way a person looks at the world, their unstated assumption about everything, is backwards? Is it possible to help them reason their way out? Can you talk someone out of their own ego? According to St. Paul, the answer is no. We are not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. So how does St. Paul reach his disciples in Roman Corinth? Before modern computers, there was another form of dangerous malware. It was a kind of analog software distributed by God himself through the hands of Moses in letters divinely inscribed. Richard and I discuss 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 137 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We continue to be treated to an inside look at the pedagogy of the Apostle Paul. So much of what Paul is talking about is how to teach, not just what to teach. Paul is always bombarding us with how he teaches, how he does things. I feel like mainstream Christianity is an example of how Paul's opponents teach. I think so. You do not find many people who teach the way St. Paul is commanding them to teach. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. The one thing I want to point out here that ties very nicely with 1 Corinthians, you mentioned this earlier today, Richard. Paul talked about the foolishness of God, And now he's using the foolishness of God to teach. He himself is playing the buffoon, as Father Paul Tarazi would say, and sometimes coming across as a tyrant, sometimes coming across as a lamb. And this makes no sense to people. This appears as foolishness in human terms. And that's why modern Christianity does not look like the teaching of the Apostle Paul. It looks like the teaching of Paul's opponents because in order to gain favor from human beings, you can't appear as foolish. One of the most important things in leadership, and you know this, Richard, is that you have to provide consistency for your team. Because if people don't feel secure and feel that they have a place in the world and a clear vision and feel that everything is predictable so that they can move forward and they know what their mission is, they're not going to be inspired to achieve outcomes for the company. So what Paul is doing here is counterintuitive and is not a recipe for building a megachurch. It's upsetting to me because I've been recently reading about management books that are very well liked among churches. And one of the things is they teach you how to expand your bottom line and how now we have church franchises that don't just appear in one place, but they appear in multiple locations at the same time. The worldly management comes into the church. Now we think, oh, this is American. No, this is not American. This is Roman just as much. Paul is trying to change our mind. We've been harping on this point so much that what people understand to be strength is weakness and what people understand to be weakness is strength. And Paul is trying to change your mind. He's trying to upend your values. He's trying not to inspire you or to give you a little energy so that you can get through the week until next Sunday. He is trying to hack your brain. When he says foolishness, those of you who have been listening for a while know to beware here because he's not talking about silliness here. He's talking about foolishness that's going to disrupt what you believe 
is wisdom because what you believe is wisdom is upside down. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Paul has been telling them, the reason why I'm doing this is so you can have a true belief, a true trust, a true faith in this teaching so that eventually you'll actually be serving one another with a decent community where people are taking care of each other rather than the selfishness and the vying for hierarchy that I'm actually seeing. So he's saying, I'm going to be foolish even as long as I can present you as people who actually follow the teaching. The reason Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, because Paul's reference is not foolishness or worldly wisdom. You can be wise in worldly terms and be evil, and you can be foolish in human terms and be wise. It all depends on how your foolishness functions. That's the trick. This idea of function that comes out of the Tarazi school of exegesis. This idea that a thing's value is not the thing itself, but how it operates in the narrative, and by extension, how things operate in the world around you, is the cornerstone of biblical wisdom. Because once you understand it's about function, you can't be fooled. So Paul, in his foolishness, is manifesting divine power. He's not manifesting wimpiness, which is how Christians read the New Testament. He is manifesting power. You just can't recognize it because you're not thinking in scriptural functional terms. His foolishness is going to attack your wisdom. It's not wimpy. His foolishness is going to hack your brain. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And here, the word purity reminds me of the purity of heart in the Beatitudes. It's not about ritual purity. It's about a singleness of purpose. The way a soldier is pure in his intention. He knows what the mission is and nothing's going to get in his way. Well, and interesting, the, the root here is agnotis, which is like an ignorance even. So it's like an ignorance of everything except Christ. Now, one thing I think we also need to reiterate is that when he says Christ, don't forget, when Paul says Christ, he's not just talking about a guy. He's talking about the one who was crucified because he followed his father's will, the one whom we have pledged our devotion to. So when he says Christ, he's using it as a very technical term. Now, one thing I found strange here in the Greek is simplicity it can be translated both as simplicity as in a singleness, but it can also be translated as abundance. Aplotis. And I think that it's significant that when he's talking about being deceived like Eve, what Eve did is she gave up the bounty of the garden in order to have this one tree, which was the beginning of her destruction. And so Christ gives you this bounty, but you're willing to give up that bounty by looking around for different things that you might want to follow. And each one of those is the serpent. He's not talking about a literal serpent here. He's talking about a different teaching that will conflict with this single teaching of the one who was crucified because he did the will of his father, the one that we gave our devotion to. So Paul is concerned that the people are going to lose what they have because their eyes are wandering. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. He talks about Jesus here. He doesn't say Christ, he says Jesus. Because the Christ is the one that embodies this teaching that Paul is trying to convey. Another Jesus has another teaching, which Paul will say is not the Christ. That Jesus that they're talking about is not Christ. It's some Jesus. I don't know who that is. It sounds so similar to the first chapter of Galatians. Paul found it necessary to say this on more than one occasion in more than one letter. You can't follow a different teaching. There's one teaching. 
And that's what you have to follow. You can't go after these other things. Just like Eve. Eve heard the teaching of God, don't eat from this tree. And then there was another teaching. The serpent says, oh, I don't think it's going to be a big deal if you eat from that tree. Well, which teaching you want to follow? She decided to follow the teaching of the serpent and lost everything. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. You have to ask the question, which sense of eminent is he using here? Which sense of inferior is he using here? Because inferior and eminent are exactly those terms he's trying to hack. He's trying to change your mind about what the hierarchy is. What is inferior? Because don't forget, Christ is the one who made himself inferior. So when Paul says, I consider myself inferior to the eminent apostles, if the other apostles are eminent, is that a good thing? He doesn't answer it yet, but he raises the question. If you're tracking with Paul, you have to say, uh, I'm on unsteady ground now. Darn, I'm going to have to find another apostle that I can follow, maybe one of the more eminent ones. No, I'm not of Paul. I am of Peter. Well, I am of John. Who is the most eminent of the apostles? And then you have the exact argument that Paul was trying to undermine. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. Don't assume that because I didn't give an eloquent toast at your gathering, that I don't have something to say or I don't have knowledge. In the previous chapter, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. You know, he doesn't sound impressive, but he's saying, it's my knowledge. And by following my knowledge, you'll be following the teaching of Christ. And by that, then you can have the bounty that you receive from that teaching. But you have to get through your first impressions of what I sound like. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? Now, Paul didn't commit a sin, but I feel like he's talking to a room full of our peers. He's still speaking foolishly. Yes, and we're sitting around, Midwesterners, who live comfortably in the suburbs, thinking, oh, isn't it so nice that Paul was humble? <sighs> we should all be humble just like Paul. And once you talk that way, Paul's pedagogical trickery failed because you are supremely, superlatively arrogant by judging Paul. Oh, it's so nice that he's so humble. And why do you judge Paul that way? Because you think you're humble. And you want him and view him and understand him as a reflection of your ego. Paul is smashing all that. Now, did Paul make a mistake? Heck no, because it's entrapment. Because he knows that when he plays the fool, you're going to clap for him. And then he's going to smash you for clapping. Father, how come we have to pay you so much? Paul taught the gospel for no money. <laughs> This is the reason why it becomes a problem because, they, oh, see, Paul was good because he decided not to take money. Father, you should be more like that. But he's speaking to the listener. Why do you not treat the one who brings you the teaching with the utmost respect? And in spite of your desire not to pay him, you pay him out of respect. Let him turn it down and then insist because he's offering so much to you. That's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul, when he talks about this issue of payment and salary, goes out of his way to let you know that he's doing you a favor by not taking money from you, but he does it in such a way, as we said in an earlier episode, that you don't feel good about it and you don't feel good about him. Here he's saying you're feeling good about it. If that's the outcome, then maybe I screwed up. How do you teach people not to worship other people or themselves. That's what's going on. It's the paradox. You know, in Scripture, if your pastor is not driving a nicer car than you, then shame on you. But if you're the pastor and you take a dime from your flock, shame on you. But if you're the pastor and you're referenced like Paul is Scripture, you will drive a junker or you will drive a limousine in order to to teach the gospel. So both the junker or the fancy car become didactic. But if for one minute you take the fancy car from your parish because you think you deserve it and you've earned it, you're condemned. It's not the thing that matters. It's not the thing that matters. It's how it functions. And that's why you cannot judge. 
When you cannot judge a pastor for wearing nice clothes, and you cannot praise a pastor for wearing shabby clothes. You cannot judge. You cannot criticize someone for being arrogant. You cannot applaud someone for being humble. You cannot take this teaching and turn it around and say that the way you're supposed to be is arrogant. If you're talking this way, you're trying to write another Torah. There is no rule book. There is Paul's premise, which is the word of God. When the Pope takes the metro, all the liberals clap for him. Exactly. Because he's not spending all this money on fancy cars and drivers. Instead, the question is, why are you too good to take the metro? He's the Pope. The Pope should go to the progressive convention in the most expensive car he can drive. And he should go to the Davos convention on a tricycle. That's the point. And you can't even make a rule out of what I said. Because if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, in the way Paul is training you to be, you don't say this is what you should do in this situation. You arrive to the situation and scripture teaches you what to say in that moment. This is what it means to have the word inscribed on your heart. It's not common sense. It's biblical sense supplanting your common sense. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. What he's saying is, I'm your father. I don't need anything from you. And I'm not going to burden you. And don't come to me like these silly people who, when their parents are retired, say, I'm going to take care of you because I owe you. You did it for me, Dad. I'm going to do it for you. No, I'm your father forever. I provide for you. I don't need anything from you. I don't care if I'm homeless. I don't want anything from my kids. Not out of spite or pride, out of love. So they should feel ashamed because their father did all this for them. And this is not the first time that Paul has used the Macedonians to shame the Corinthians. And last time he was talking about how generous the Macedonians were and how the Macedonians supplied everything that he needed. I made it a burden on the Macedonians so that I would not burden you. Neither making a burden nor not making a burden is good. Paul is using them both didactically. With the Macedonians, he made himself a burden. On you, I did not make you a burden. So you can thank them. I'm doing this on my own dime. What are you doing on your dime? This is the most powerful didactic statement on the planet. This is why I think the model of the career teacher or the career priest over time has corrupted both institutions. Because we've come to a point now where at the local university, kids fill out reviews about their teachers and then their wealthy parents make decisions about how much money to give to the university based on how someone who doesn't know anything evaluates how a teacher made them feel. Teacher's not a product you consume. This bloody consumerism is from the devil. A teacher is someone who brings light. We've lost this. We've lost parenthood and we've lost the respect for the institution of the teacher. And in scripture, the teacher is the father. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. Whether I boast or whether I humble myself, I am your father and I am providing for you. This is for you, not for you, for you. It is for you so that you would grow to full maturity in the gospel and provide for others like your brothers and sisters in Macedonia. Ultimately, what Paul is saying is that Macedonia has matured. You haven't matured in Christ yet. I'm still having to deal with you like little children. Let the reader beware. When Paul talks about how he's going to continue to boast, he's not boasting so you can say, yeah, Paul, let's get behind Paul. He boasts so he can start to chip away at your ego because it's your ego that, like Eve, thinks, hmm, which teaching should I follow? Let me think for a minute. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. In other words, in the case of the false teachers, 
you better believe I'm going to remind you that while they were fishing, I was working on Wall Street. I'm going to remind you that when they were playing around in Judea, I was studying at the feet of the greatest scholars in the Pharisaic tradition. Are you kidding me? In worldly terms, I can crush you any time. The difference between me and you is that my worldly achievements, as he points out in Galatians, are irrelevant. And here, he wants to cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are. So, there are other ones who want to take this position of father and teacher. They are not teachers. They are not fathers. The reason why is because they don't teach this way. Like you said, I know how teaching is supposed to function. I have knowledge that they simply don't have. How do I know this is the case? Because you can look at how they function and how I function. You can see by how we function that I have different knowledge than they do. And Paul, the Roman citizen, this must never be lost on the addressees of the New Testament. Paul, the Roman citizen, not only knows scripture backwards and forwards as a true Pharisee, but he understands power and wealth. And as a Jew who achieved the status of Roman citizen, he was no fool. The other thing is he has more to lose. Yes. The one who is not a citizen who thumbs his nose at the empire has much less to lose than someone who is already a citizen and has all the privileges that go with it. He's willing to give up more privilege than those people even have. Men like this who are willing to risk everything for the sake of the other are the ones who are honest and straightforward and pure in their deeds as opposed to false teachers, the opponents of Paul. For such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So how do you disguise yourself? You present yourself in an appealing way for personal gain, as opposed to the one who stands up and presents themselves as a fool for the sake of the other and is willing to lose everything. Status is what Paul is really disrupting. The serpent who spoke cunningly, who spoke intelligently. The serpent spoke very well and very eloquently to Eve. So don't trust flowing soft words. Be careful. So when your pastor stands up, whatever denomination you are, and says something nice about the parish to the parish, there is a serious risk that you are forfeiting the promise of life in scripture by receiving that compliment. When a teacher gets up and praises the classroom, there is a very serious, dangerous risk that knowledge and wisdom are being traded for revenue to the institution the teacher works at. When a parent heaps praise on their child, it is an expression of selfishness. Unless the praise, in rare circumstances, functions as an expression of love because of the situation the child finds itself in. But in most cases, human beings heap praise on other human beings or heap gratitude on other human beings in order to extract profit. I've seen it my whole career. You take entry-level employees and you work them to death by telling them how amazing they are. And it takes them 15 years to figure out that they were fooled. Scripture is giving you a shortcut. Do your job and support your family and get along in the world so that you have time to preach the gospel. But if you do it because you like the praise your boss gives you, you're already done. You're a slave. You'll never find life. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. An angel is one who brings a message, who brings a teaching. And the more I read this chapter, the more play I see between the serpent and Paul as ones who teach something, one who teaches unto destruction and one who teaches unto life. And here, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We had Satan disguised as a serpent at the beginning of the chapter. And here, angel of light meaning someone who brings a message of light. But this is a disguise because what he actually brings is a message of darkness and death and destruction. Because Paul's message is, man is not God. And Satan's message is, man can become God. And he fools you into accepting this message by presenting himself as somebody who's meek. That's the insidious nature of the lie. And again, you can present yourself as the one who is weak or as the one who is strong. 
And you cannot make a judgment based on that. You need to look at what's actually going on based on the premise of the one acting and how their behavior functions. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So they make themselves look righteous, they do the right things, and everyone gives them a round of applause, they bow and they move on to the next crowd that will give them a round of applause. And this is how the servants of Satan function as they're very pleasing. They get a round of applause. I was just thinking, you know, in iconography, how many ways we have of depicting Satan as a shadowy, dark, scary figure. No, they're the most pleasing figures around. They're the ones who make you feel good about yourself because there's nothing more evil than an unchecked human ego. Have a great week. Thank you, too. Just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.